Hello, my name is Jamie O'Hare. I am a lecturer at Abertay University, where I'm also the program leader of the ethical hacking degree. And today, I'm just going to record a kind of non-live version of my talk I gave at B-Sides London this year. I wasn't particularly a fan of my delivery of that talk, which is quite ironic as a lecturer. So I just thought I would re-record that and kind of add in the bits that I forgot, take out the ums, and if I need to, edit. So you're seeing me at the Tuesday after B-Sides London, um, a bit loaded with the con flu. Uh, it's not COVID as of yet, but uh, we've still got tests to do though. Um, but I'll just kind of go over what I was meant to say at the weekend in a much more kind of familiar method of me, as I'm a university lecturer, mostly during the pandemic. But this isn't my first time speaking at B-Size London, so it wasn't. Uh, I spoke previously. Back before the pandemic, I gave a talk on the Rookie Track, which is a fantastic initiative that uh, B-Size uh, London are run. Uh, and on that book, uh, Rookie Track, I spoke about uh, bug bounty programs and kind of the idea about reporting vulnerabilities, and that's what the talk was about. And this is all a part of my master's thesis uh, that I'd done when I was an Edinburgh Napier student. Um, that's kind of where I was for a long time, about five, almost six years, um, when I was a undergrad student doing computer security and forensics, an MSc student doing uh, advanced security and digital forensics, and then I was also the president of the hacking society there called NUSEC. Um, and under the tutelage of Obi-Wan Kenobi, Rich McFarlane here, uh, I learned quite a lot about kind of lecturing, cyber security and all other things like that. But if Obi-Wan Kenobi is obviously represents the light side of the force, we've got a bit of dark side of the force and that's where uh, Colin McLean comes in. Like most people, I met Colin McLean in the pub and we get chatting about education um, and this was during my time as a, as a Napier student. In all coincidence, I am giving a talk about Aberty's ethical hacking curriculum 10 years after Colin originally spoke about ethical hacking curriculum at Aberty at B-Sides London in 2012, um, which is, yeah, it's a bit of an odd coming back full circle and me speaking about it at the weekend there, um, yeah. But the quick thing, because among you might have noticed that I didn't touch on my industry experience in my Who Am I section, and that's because I don't have any. Um, but I don't think this is disadvantaging me or my students either. The role of a, a lecturer has changed quite a lot, especially in the last 20 years as information became more readily available through the internet, but much more in the last handful of years through the pandemic and kind of what that is like. And as my mum likes to call me the forever student, I would say I kind of live up to that through this quote that lecturers aren't the sources of knowledge, but more the curators of knowledge. And what I kind of mean by that is that we are not the authoritative figure that someone comes to to gain knowledge about that subject. We are more the person you come to to kind of tour you through that subject and get you to the point that you want to be, to then be in a similar position. Um, obviously, this is kind of a weird term for a lecturer, those authoritative sources still exist, obviously, um, but there is a place for these curator type of people, and that's what I would say I kind of pride myself on. This curation aspect is super important to me and how I am as a lecturer, but it also is important to my students and kind of teaching a subject like uh, cybersecurity and ethical hacking um, at a university because currently universities are kind of like in an odd place in the cybersecurity industry. There is these uh, amazing organisations, as you can see on the screen, that are doing quite a lot of cool and innovative and just amazing work at getting more people into the industry. So therefore, the kind of traditional educational venue of a university is displaced. Um, a lot of people are starting to, to look at wh what does a university offer you that these uh, other paths don't um, and this is like a paradigm shift in this education it's not like a, a licensed um, 
field where you have to go through the university. Um, there is all, that, all this available to you, and whatever path isn't like kind of discredited, and that's a very good thing. But it means that this kind of university education is a bit out there, and it's becoming an issue. Students, and I've got these tweets and uh, this talk, I've actually um, given permission to show these, but these tweets are from students who are, hmm, what would you say, kind of not enjoying or valuing their cybersecurity education provided solely at their university and are gaining a lot more knowledge and a lot more skills they see more beneficially through the extracurricular or alternative streams of education, which when you are paying for education, um, in some other circumstances could, you know, ask you what are you paying for. So this kind of looks back at like what are the universities providing, especially when compared to extracurricular stuff. And it's a massive issue, as you can see from these tweets. And if you were around when these tweets were tweeted, then you would have known that there was quite a big hubbub about all this stuff. And this kind of discourse about cybersecurity at a university is dominated from the students or the employers. And I don't think as, a, as the lecturers and the kind of academics get to kind of give their say too much. I kind of hide behind the purpose. Like I, I, I'm on Twitter, I'm doing stuff, but I am not... Um, I'm not taking part in that discussion because I find that, you know, the character limit and whatnot kind of impedes your ability to get the point across, hence this talk. So what I'm going to try and show you uh, through this kind of lecture today is what my point of view looks like and what I'm doing. However, I'm not just here to show off. <laughs> um, I'm always looking to kind of refine how I am teaching. Um, as such, this QR code takes you to a um, Microsoft form where you can fill in um, feedback and I'll get in touch and I can I can read the feedback form and this is kind of what I'll be looking at if you want to give me feedback in a kind of a way such as this. Additionally um, I'm also looking for other academics to feed off of this work um, as we're all aware academia is kind of sharing knowledge and this is going to be a part of it but if you do use this talk as a kind of learning tool then make sure you drop me a line as we all know how important it is for kind of being able to demonstrate uh, impact and stuff like that. That's part of the academic life. So before we can get into the nitty gritty details, I first have to set the scene. Abertay is a small, around about 4,500 uh, students, ex-Polytechnic University and Dundee in Scotland. <laughs> This means quite a bit. We have um, a very low student number, as you can see other big universities are much larger than us. However, my the marketing department for the uni would probably say we're small but mighty. Um, and that kind of reinforces the approach we do. We don't try and teach many theoretical subjects. Uh, it's mostly we talk about practical, hands-on, technical, vocational kind of degrees. So while we have accolades for education, such as the NCSE's ACSE Award, uh, which were the only university in Scotland to have the Gold Award, what you'll likely, more, likely know Abertay for more is our students. Um, they run the Abertay Ethical Hacking Society, which in turn run the Security Conference. And this picture here is from the Abertay Ethical Hacking students who went to B-Side London in 2014, if I remember correctly, uh, long before my time. But as you can see, they've been around for quite a while, um, all the way back since about 2006 and kind of cybersecurity events. So um, they pop up everywhere and it's highly likely that you've probably met someone in your career, work in a team with, or know an Abertay graduate from the FGO Hacken degree. Um, it kind of goes far reaching as that. But the makeup of these students kind of gives implications on what we can do. Our students are mostly Scottish. Um, this means that they don't pay for university. Uh, instead of paying the nine grand that they might pay in the rest of the UK for their uh, education, we receive about £1,280 per student per year from the Scottish government. This doesn't mean we get a lot of money. Um, 
And this kind of comes up because I was at a talk recently in which a, a university lecturer was telling me that they spent a million pound for a pen test module that at that point hadn't had any students on it. Um, that is out of the question within our scope and resources at Aberty um, and within my kind of remit. So therefore, to teach this kind of authentic vocational uh, part of the kind of degree and how we teach in a philosophy of teaching, the curation aspect that I talked about previously is crucial. And while we run this throughout our degrees, what I'm going to specifically be talking about today is my web pen testing module. This module is run in third year. Uh, it builds upon kind of previous modules that the students would hopefully have done. And in a bridged version, we teach to our master's students uh, in term two. So there is a bit more than just kind of meets the eye. There's stuff going on behind the scenes when it comes to this uh, module two. And as much as it looks like it, academics really just can't go, ah, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, just turn up and give a lecture about this this day. Uh, we have kind of things we have to hit and what these things are called is learning outcomes. Uh, there's three for this module, as you can see, to analyse and critically evaluate uh, techniques used in the to test web application security, to critically evaluate specific countermeasures to advance hacking techniques, and to demonstrate a critical evaluation of an advanced security topic with an independent project. So quite a bit there um, to chew on. But if you look at the, the bold bits that are put there, the ones that analyse, critically evaluate, uh, demonstrate a critical evaluation, they're bolded for a reason. Even though we're teaching web application security, when you boil it down, we're really teaching these higher order thinking skills that you would get in a university degree, no matter the subject. And that includes independent thinking, research skills, thinking logically, communication skills. We're just teaching it through the guise of web app hacking. Um, which... Yeah, when you break it down like that, an ethical hacking degree is very much like any other degree when it comes to a university setting. The application of these skills and how you pick them up is how it defines what you'd be doing. If, God forbid, AI ever comes along and kind of stops at the need for computer security specialists, then someone with an ethical hacking degree still has the ability for these independent thinking, research skills, logical thinking, communication, which still makes them hireable and still makes them a more rounded individual than they would without the degree, hopefully. But before we jump into talking about kind of my modules in particular, I want to just take a step back and talk about universities. Uh, I've got kind of an expectation of my students and then the reality of what that is like. And while this expectation is very utopian, um, the reality is the opposite of that and very dystopian. Um, we're not getting students as kind of engaged as we hoped, and that's sector-wide. Um, this Twitter thread that is kind of shown in this meme um, it's probably something to go seek out if you're kind of in this area and want to understand tertiary education in the UK and the current impact affecting it. Um, there's two threads from this uh, lecturer which are fantastic at discussing what it's like as a lecturer day to day. But just to give that there's a wider context than, you know, just the we give a cyber security education there's also the sector and all the impact that that could play as well i'm not going to use it as a cop out i just want people to be cognizant that there is stuff that i'm trying to do alongside kind of being a lecturer and teaching the content that plays into this so without further ado let's get on to the module so before the pandemic it looked something like this 10 hours of three week classes in person well attended so this makes up about 30 of the 200 hours we'd expect a student to put in for the uh, work for the module. These 200 hours obviously is very ambitious. A student doesn't do as many as that, and I know that. Um, but just to give you that you're meant to be doing about 200 hours of work per trimester, per module. Um, so out of these 10 weeks, we'd expect about 200 hours. Obviously, there'd be more weeks for the assessment and stuff like that. But yeah, 200 hours we expect a student to put in for one class. 
So while the lectures were updated every year and given in person, the real meat of the module is the kind of practical exercise we were doing. These are exploratory in nature, looking at the underlying principles and then the techniques and then the tools. The tools were just kind of a venue to explore. There is no question and answer in these handouts or the practical content, although there were small segments of kind of unprompted, unguided practice. The, the practical content usually followed the, the manual first and automated afterwards, so showing you how to do an SQL injection by hand and then showing you kind of SQL map and other ways in which you could do it. We used an array of tools to kind of teach you different techniques and whatnot, so you'd be using one tool for one instance, another from the other, and it was just a kind of let students explore as many different tools as they wanted and then to kind of let them evaluate what tool they liked best and what tool they could put into the tool belt and use in their assessment. The content was quite heavily reliant on LAMP training apps from the OSWBA. That's not to say that these were just out of the box exercise and said, here's the box and go learn from it. It was saying that we used these as a basis and then built upon them with significant additions came from years and years of teaching this content, refining it, adding a little bit more. Um, and that was how each year it just kind of got more and more. Um, and the OSBWA that students get is very much different from what you would get if you were doing this as a training on the site. However, all these kind of refinements and additions came to a sudden halt over the pandemic. Those kind of efforts and the stuff that you do every week to kind of innovate on what you're teaching were halted so that we could then actually be able to teach. <laughs> um, lectures moved online, so it required us to record all the lectures. We had to then also subtitle all the lectures. We had to uh, make sure we could complete the practical outside of the lab environment. We had to go on to the campus when uh, restrictions allowed meaning that you are potentially doing more teaching than you would normally and cutting into your time that you would innovate. But the main part of it was how do we teach the students who don't have access to really good equipment and can't download the VMware stuff at home. As such, uh, Colin spent a lot of time and effort setting up Azure Labs for the students so they could pay by, or the university paid by hour based on how long the students were using the kind of bespoke environment meant to replicate the lab environment in the cloud. But this wasn't kind of for nothing. Um, after we came out of the pandemic, what Colin and I had amassed was a very healthy and a very flexible uh, web application hacking module where we could teach on campus, we could teach it online, we could do a bit of both. And this is where I step in as Colin is winding down to retire, um, I kind of step into the breach to take up the responsibilities. Quite formidable task, uh, I will say it's, it's it's not hard, it's not easy. Uh, not hard, <laughs> it's, it's very hard. Uh, it's definitely uh, not easy and it's much more difficult if I didn't have this kind of solid basis to go off. In that kind of sense, I'm very much like Donkey, and complimenting the boulder that I'm going to then sculpt into what I want the module to look like. After all, we're academics, we tend to disagree on what we should be teaching, and um, I've got plans for this module to take it in a, a slightly different direction, kind of do what I want to and take ownership. So I got this nice boulder, it's now time to grab the, the hammer and chisel and sculpt what I want it to be. So here we are post-pandemic in some sense and post my takeover of the module this all happened with the kind of coinciding of the covid restrictions easing however it was done late enough that i missed the cutoff of the university bureaucracy to change stuff so we're in a bit of a transition where i can change some things but i can't change it all so what did i change well a lot and sometimes not a lot. I kept the COVID recorded lectures because they're quite okay. Um, and, you know, it gave me more time. I didn't have to prep for lectures every week. 
Um, and that was a pretty good kind of uh, situation. The students were used to record the lectures. I kept the 10 weeks of free hour classes. However, at this kind of lectorial session in which we studied a lecture in the first hour, followed by the practical, where the lectures were still there to help you out, but just in the same room, I kept that format. Um, but I started, instead of doing the lecture for the first hour, I did a wee class activity. Uh, and this could range, as you're going to see, um, across different things. I kept all existing module content, that, which worked, um, rearranging and reordering stuff uh, and making my own significant uh, additions, helped by things like OWASP, helped by one of my students at Mule and Oracle, who was a community manager for Try Hack Me and did a lot of CTF, so he was able to kind of help me with specific um, target boxes and techniques and stuff that I hadn't come across yet. Furthermore, I was able to kind of lean on the, the open data available in HackerOne um, to kind of add modern sides and stuff like that to the module. Additionally, we kept all the delivery methods that were available. Uh, Hack Lab or on person in campus at Abertay was still was the kind of promoted one, but you could also install locally at home. And in worst case scenarios, students could use the Azure virtual machine that was still lying about uh, to still carry out the exercises and assessment we needed. But this is the kind of broad strokes I'm telling you about right now for the module. What does it look like from a student's perspective? Well, that's what the next slides are going to focus on. So hopefully you'll see what it was like for a student that was doing this class this year. So a week for a student would actually start the week previously. I'd release all my content a week in advance. So therefore students would be able to plan around what content was there, as well as it gave me a deadline of not changing things up to the last minute, which I was prone to do. They were given this via an email notification for the virtual learning environment they went to. And this included like a detailed explainer of that week's uh, topic, which they'll be going over, what content is there, how many lectures, how uh, big the practical was, if there's going to be an on-campus session or not. Um, and then what is required of them that week, just giving them a reminder that, you know, they're expected to complete all this work. And as an expectation and a reward for completing all the work, they would get a badge. Um, keep in mind the badges. I'm not going to touch them for a wee while, but we'll get back to them at the end. The first order of business for the students was then to watch the lectures. These are obviously the pre-recorded uh, videos from over the pandemic. And while the individual video lengths varied quite a lot, uh, overall they last about the same time as an in-person lecture. As I said, these uh, have to be all captioned, which is a pain with my accent, uh, but we get through. Additionally, I also provide a, the PowerPoint file for the students if they just want to read through. Ideally, students should watch all of these lectures before coming on campus, but this doesn't stop them from turning up with headphones and watching it uh, in class and maybe perhaps during the class activity, which is kind of minimizing their effectiveness at a university education, the expectation is there for you to use my time to your benefit the most. Um, and it's that on-campus, face-to-face learning, which kind of is unique to a university degree, which you can learn a lot more from You know, speaking to, a, I would say, industry expert or whatever, but maybe a subject matter expert, but really I'm a subject matter curator and able to point students in the right direction to what they will need to to learn or want to learn. What did these lectures look like? Well, as I said, they were recorded during the pandemic in my old living room, standing up, which got a lot of weird compliments uh, in comparison to my colleagues. Um, and it was recorded with the same mic that I've got now, which is just a gaming mic that I use, as well as my laptop webcam, which I've since upgraded. Um, perhaps not to my benefit though, I'm, I'm looking a bit pale. Um, these aren't great videos. But they're not bad either. They're just kind of, I wouldn't want to release them wider for the fact that I'm not particularly proud of them. So after they've watched the, the lecture, then they're expected to then come on to the on-campus class. 
this is our three hours in the Hack Lab, as I said, in an electoral format. And for this year, it was on a Tuesday afternoon from 2 to 5. However, as I mentioned, I did the recorded lectures, but I wanted to promote engagement, to come to campus, to learn there, to, you know, see me every week and kind of get a rapport with the students. So what did I do? Well, I created these class activities that would kind of just come up with every week to, you know, go through at the start of a class and get them involved. And this might include doing a demonstration of some uh, a vulnerability, a technique or some tools Maybe a wee mini lecture about something that came to my head that week about specific to web app hacking or somewhat related. I would also discuss the academic research in which I would talk about stuff that, you know, isn't really super cutting edge, but shows more of a comprehensive approach to both the university web app hacking and putting all together all the skills that they're learning. I would also do kind of fun activities one thing I done was play a cyber card right in which I gave my best Bruce Forsyth impression and I had, to, I had to explain who Bruce Forsyth was to many of them um, which was very disheartening but I had to explain the rules is play a cyber card right I'd give them a vulnerability in a scenario and they had to tell me if the next one was going to be higher or lower based on the kind of CVSS or how they rate the vulnerability on a web app and then we also had things like menti quizzes in which they had their phone and they could fill in things like uh, answer multiple choice questions. What I used for that was uh, the CISP questions um, that related to web app hacking, just to kind of show them that what's expected of them when if they're going for that certification and keep them a bit more in the loop of what's going on. After doing this activity, it was time to start the main event, the practical exercise. I've hyped up enough. I want to really kind of get to grips and show you what these look like. So it's accessible on the virtual learning environment. And the practical isn't really standalone. There could be uh, programs you have to install. There could be a demonstration video or even some output so the students can compare against. And while it's possible for the students to read and complete before going to the lab, obviously if we release it a, a week before schedule, I really want them to start it in the lab sessions so therefore they can get help from staff if needed i can speak to them about how they're progressing through it um, as well as i'm able to debug something um, with all of them there um, rather than sending emails and having to do ping pong back and forth that said what does it actually look like in the document we hand out well they became quite big documents so they, they definitely vary uh, 45 pages plus is normal for me and um, that's with all my additions on this year I did make them quite long this means it isn't really possible for a student to complete one of the exercises within the hours allocated on campus no fret though they can complete at home if they've got the Azure VMs or the VMware licenses but there's also other places on campus where they can get access to the same lab environments and complete it there be it in the hack lab or the other associated labs after hours or in between classes. But if you're a meticulous student and you're spending all the time going through all the links and reading everything that's there, it'll probably take you between 6 to 12 hours to complete one of them. Um, probably not the 12 hours unless I've linked something very, very long. But it's to give the students like something to fill up those 200 hours they're meant to be doing on the module. Exercises start with like a quick reference cheat sheet of the lab environment, just in case they forget any IP addresses, the passwords, where stuff's located. A very simple thing, quality of life update that I made, just to kind of help the students go on their way. It then progresses into a small reading section meant to supplement their uh, learning, as well as to get them kind of drilled in, sitting down, make sure they're on their own work and not chatting away and they're able to just kind of get in the mindset of, you know, I'm going to be reading this, I'm going to read all the what it says, so therefore they're not skipping over it when it comes to it. It then moves on to the practical components in which we focus on specific techniques. Here's an example of the table of contents for kind of that section, and as you can see, it's very perhaps tool-orientated, but 
I wouldn't be too worried about that. That's more for quick reference for the students, as well as the, the kind of uh, style guide I'm using for these practical exercises. When it comes to what a specific section looks like, similar to this, um, it drills down into the tool and then how to use the tool, but then also brings in other kind of methods. It's not quickly this is this tool and this is a quick show. I, in this section, which I've kind of got go spider, I get them to then eventually go on to running diff commands and comparing and contrasting um, how to use the tool. Um, and that kind of gets them to think more about what the functionality of the tool is beyond, oh yeah, I just run this command, copy and paste it in. One thing I do get all the students to do when I first get them to run a tool is to look at the manual or the help page uh, if available. And this is a great way to check, one, if the tool is properly installed, it won't run otherwise, uh, as well as to get the student to think about how they can then explore by using all these different flags. Uh, yeah, and that kind of kind of helps in that kind of regard of getting them to explore and evaluate the tools that they want to use for the assessment. After the practical exercise comes some written exercises. Uh, a new addition this year, um, it's just to give them a theoretical scenario, um, mostly kind of inspired from Hacker One disclosures or any pen test war stories, lectures or talks over a couple of beers I've had with uh, some friends. And the students the task to write up a vulnerability disclosure report for a given scenario. Um, this is almost like a formative assessment in which, you know, the student can write up that uh, and then put their hand up in class or come to me, write an email uh, saying, what do you think of uh, this vulnerability report? And I'm able to generate uh, some feedback for them, tell them what they should be thinking about when it comes to it, get them to um, consider kind of what would you do if this was also included. And it's just to get the students, you know, cognizant of how do you report this to a client. Finally, the practical ends with a further resource section, which again comes back to the curation aspect I'm talking about. There's only so much that I want to put in. Again, I want the average person in my class to get through it. Um, so I want to kind of still give people who are kind of got uh, they've already got knowledge in this area to go further and become an expert. I don't want all my students to become experts in web app hacking from one module. I want them to, you know, jump off where they need to if they want to become an expert because some don't want to do web app testing so they have to be cognizant of that when it comes to the module. So what does this kind of further resources include? It includes vulnerability disclosures, includes academic research, external courses, even like uh, conference talks that I've seen or uh, I'm curating, and it includes ones that I might have seen at B-Size London, for example. Now that practical exercise is a lot to chew on, and while I'm giving the students a lot about this and maybe I'm being overly serious about this, I also want to have a bit of fun with my class. So it was a non-serious kind of, exercise i give the students a movie and a song every week i do this for a couple of reasons one students have terrible taste in media uh, be it songs or uh, movies and as a more um as an older member of society i have to do my bit and get them to you know experience life to the full <laughs> Um, but there's a bit of uh, a kind of madness to a method to madness in that kind of sense. It's a brilliant icebreaker when it comes to talking to students. If you go up and go, oh, how's today's work going? They're kind of a bit shy. But if you go up and go, oh, did you see the movie this week? Is it interesting? And they went, oh, no, I, I don't really like, you know, um, George Clooney, so I'm not going to watch that. That kind of stuff then lets you then come in and... Um, then follow up with questions about how the work's going. It's, it's a much easier conversation to have. Additionally, it lets me do my best kind of Robin Williams or oh, Captain My Captain kind of thing, which uh, I, I got to teach in. Obviously, I absolutely love Dead Poet Society. Um, so my Dead Pet Tester Society that we are in the class um, is also kind of near and dear to my heart. But students aren't kind of forced to watch or listen to these, thank God. Um, so, for their badge that week. And what do you mean by badges? Well, 
my amazing better half, uh, Sarah, um, she created these badges for me, um, which relate to each week of the module. And if the student's 100% a week, they get the badge on the virtual learning environment. But what do you mean by 100%? Well, there's no easy way for me to actually work that out. The virtual learning environment is quite limited, so basically all I have to do is click on the links for each of the lectures and the practicals and all the resources, and this then gets in the badge. However, this is better than no way of working out student progress, because um, at least 85% of my students this year had got one badge. And if, if that even means they've just clicked on the links, it means they're cognizant that you know, they should be doing this. And having that kind of around about 15% uh, not having a single badge might be alarming, is very in norm with the kind of sector or even better than some of the, the sectors facing currently. But I've gone a wee step further than just all offering the badges. I've also given them a real life sticker, not just any real life stif- sticker, a holographic sticker, if they get an A or A plus on the assessment. Which, of these kind of designs, uh, we've got one in the works, which uh, I'm looking forward to getting a holographic one, even for myself. I've got to give myself one. I'm not doing the assessment, but you know, I have to mark them all, so I want to take a holographic sticker myself. Um, but the students will get that if they get an A or an A+. So while we're talking about the assessment, let's get into the details about it. I've kind of alluded to it quite a bit. It is a penetration test of a given web application. We release this on week one, and it isn't due until week 15. So they get a long time to do this assessment, much longer than you would get for a normal web app test. But that's because, you know, I want it to be as an exploratory exercise and allow the students to learn within an environment. Don't want to put them under too much pressure of giving them, you know, two days to do it and one day to write the report kind of thing. That's what a grad job is. And while I wish I could replicate what an exact web app pen test would look like, the kind of requirements of what a university is like, the higher order thinking skills, the accreditation, the what is a degree in comparison to training um, elements. I still have to put that in it, and that's why it's not a one-for-one. There's things like an abstract instead of an exec summary, there's an introduction, aims, method, procedure, and as you can see from these tables here, that is the the percentage of the report that uh, the mark is worth for that independent section. It's not to say that it's totally just for writing it up, about... 50% 50% be it the procedure, results, method, and the discussion really comes from what they achieve in the practical work. And that's not to say it's hard to find vulnerabilities on the website. Uh, it's quite easy. It's a deliberately vulnerable a web app. It's meant to be that way. We're marking the report, not how well they can uh, run tools against the website. And this isn't particularly difficult for the students as well as we kind of go a bit further with the authenticity in the sense that students get to collaborate with each other say that oh look what I tried to do on my website it didn't work but maybe it works on yours um, or I've got this far with this method but I don't know what to do from here and because each student gets a different random web app with random vulnerabilities in it they means they can collaborate but not collude and how we do this is for a tool called Swag, created by Colin. Um, you can go, if you want to learn more about Colin's tool called Swag, which is the susceptible web app generator, then there's this amazing talk from B-Sides Edinburgh I'd highly recommend you go see. So the Swag tool kind of reinforces our commitment to authenticity, that vocational skills that Avalti is kind of known for. So if you want to learn more, go check out this talk. But I'm going to now move on to, you know, some of the one-off weeks I was doing this year. To prep them for the assessment, I wanted to do a wee trial run and give the students uh, an example of how to write a report where they're cognizant of the recipient of that report. So during this reading week, a week where we usually don't do lectures, uh, I ran a one-off exercise where each student was tasked to host a different uh, web app that had different kind of vulnerabilities in it and they were then tasked to identify 
and report a vulnerability in a peer's website, so another student's website that they'd hosted, and then write a report for that vulnerability. Uh, they would then send the report to the person that they just hacked into, so therefore that person then was tasked to fix or mitigate the vulnerability that was reported to them. So this kind of step of hosting, hacking and reporting, and then solving the issue that was reported to them. This was a bit of pedagogical exercise, where they had a pre and a post test kind of survey. What did they think beforehand? What did they think after? Uh, and I've submitted to an academic conference. Hopefully, I'll be seeing the sunny beaches of Greece in June. That's just the benefits of academic life. But we have to touch with that I actually get accepted. If not, uh, the sur- it might take a wee while to come out. But I'll give you the too long didn't read. Students really struggle if there is no guardrails on how to identify vulnerabilities. This is obviously very problematic. We're meant to be teaching them, you know, independent research, be able to think logically and whatnot. And if they're struggling to identify vulnerabilities on a deliberately vulnerable website, then, you know, we could be looking at um, they're just not engaging with material or they're finding it really hard to kind of put it all together in a bigger picture. Those who are able to identify vulnerabilities are not including enough details and not thinking about the recipient. Um, And what I get them to do is to compare what they've written to the ISO standard, which is on screen, 29147 2018 Annex B. And in this, has a list of things you should include. This aligns with what HackerOne, what BugCrowd and what Google kind of ask you to write in bug bounty reports you submit to them, it's best practices on writing vulnerability disclosures and I just give them as a guide of what they should be hitting, it's just a little bit more academic than pointing them towards HackerOne or or, uh, or Google or whatnot where it could change, uh, ISO is a bit more. Another one-off week that I'd done was I had a guest lecture, I had two returning graduates come to speak about their experiences as web app 10 testers, uh, due to their familiarity with the curriculum. Um, they were able to cut through straight to kind of what the students would already know. There was no, right, this is what an idol is kind of thing, or this is what this kind of specific exploit is. They should already know that because Ross and James had done the module when they uh, were students here. So really, it was just a war stories talk. Um, and it reinforced basically everything that I taught them to that point. As such, the students loved it. They felt that they were on the right path and that they were able to understand all the stories that Ross and James told them. Additionally, uh, as I work for Pentest Partners, the free socks kind of made it very good and uh, the students were very engaged to ask good questions because of the, the enticement of free socks. And kind of despite not finishing until mid January, uh, at the, the week before B sides, I'd actually got the module feedback forms. Um, for the module, don't worry, I mean this is just academia, this is how it works. Um, here's a quick overview, staff are good at explaining things, 89% made the subject interesting, 92% and satisfied the module, 93%. I am over the moon with these numbers. We're going through a bit of transitional time with the module, I didn't get a very high turnout on the survey, um, but these numbers are very encouraging especially uh, with my first run of it. Um, so I'm really happy with those modules, uh, those numbers, um, but the qualitative stuff that you can see below, uh, I'm not going to speak through all of them, is kind of why I'm a lecturer and not an industry professional. Comments like this is, I mean, I, I, these are excerpts of them. It kind of reinforces what I'm doing, and I'm just really, I get a warm, fuzzy feeling inside when you get stuff like this. So with scores and kind of comments like that, I must think I'm really daft for going to B-Size, Leeds, uh, B-Size London and asking for feedback. And even then recording this video and asking for feedback on a quite public platform. And that's because I want to keep on progressing at what I'm doing. I'm, I'm obviously not aiming for perfection. I can't get all of those numbers to 100%. As you can't please everybody, sell AV, but... I kind of want to make sure that I'm on the right path for making sure that I'm keeping up to date, that I'm telling the students exactly what I need to, that I am creating the best curriculum that I can possible. Going back to the art analogy, 
I'm trying to imbue through this field talk, I don't think you can ever say something's perfect, but you can make it the best it can be. And with that in mind, I want to now kind of take time to show you what my plans are for the future of the module. So what is the plan? Well, the plan is to look at something like this. I want to make a content cocktail because who doesn't love cocktails, especially students? Um, I want to create the lecture videos, uh, shorten them down to just an educational YouTube kind of format. This allows me to also give back to the community and release them publicly. Um, but it's also that I can then just kind of focus more on the meat of the module, which is the class activity and then the come on at campus and the practical exercise. I want to keep on refining the class activities, adding more games and adding more fun kind of things for students to do, um, as well as adding and refining the lab exercises, adding in new technologies, getting kind of retiring the old lamp stuff, um, keeping it in there, but adding in new kind of web technologies that the students will see when they go into industry. I want to kind of reduce our uh, reliance on training apps and as well as the stabilizers for students and get them to be much more independent when they come to do the projects uh, or come to do the, the practical exercises. Furthermore, I want to kind of dovetail all of this with the university's private bug bounty program that we're currently implementing, which is going to see students as both the the reporters of the bugs as well as the validators. Um, it's something that uh, myself and a, a colleague have been working on, a senior colleague have been working on for a while, um, and we're kind of like getting there soon. Uh, there is an academic paper uh, over here, oh, no, that way, um, you can go read if you've got access. If you don't, ping me an email, I'll send you it on. Um, it's something that I'm quite looking forward to as we're able to then pull bug bounty reports that sh other students have written and then use it as a kind of inspiration for the class. So that's the day-to-day -day of the kind of week-to-week, -week, what it's going to look like. But what else am I going to change? Well, the assessment. I'm going to keep the penetration test as it is, but I'm going to add a new assessment in which they're going to do giving a non-technical summary presentation of their pen test engagement that they already just done. And this should be worth around about a quarter, 20% of the mark. And these will be like five to 10 minute presentations where I'm looking to kind of reinforce the higher order thinking skills alongside the, the kind of crucial soft skills that they are looking for in graduates. Additionally, this should hopefully get me around kind of anything to do with chat, uh, chat GPT um, and shouldn't then using that for the report because they then still got to do it for the presentation and it also benefits students too I'm not trying to make them you know I'm not trying to I'm trying to make them aware of what they might be able to do in an internship situation when they're going for a, an application for an internship or for a grad job I need them to you know they're going to be asked to do a presentation eventually this is something that they're going to learn and they do it already as a group project in one module alongside mine. I want to get them on one-to-one -one basis, as well as be able to ask them questions, how do they respond to that. And one thing I'm looking at doing as well is if I do this on campus, I want to kind of promote them. They all get dressed up if they're going to wear in suits or at least come in smart, more smart than a normal student. And I'll get like a kind of nice um, headshot for them for if they need for LinkedIn or something that they can then use uh, when they're applying for jobs and getting IDs and stuff like that. That's the kind of thing that, you, that can help the students in that kind of regard. I'm not just thinking about the future, I'm actively working towards it too. Uh, and I'm doing a lot of work currently for this kind of future iteration of the module. As you can see on the right hand side here, I've got some ideas of what I'm kind of looking for for the skeleton of the module. Um, and I'm working with focus groups to try and narrow that down, refine it, think about what I'm doing. I'm working with kind of my current students as well as some graduates to think about how am I using recorded lectures, how could they be better with graduates on kind of the planned curriculum um, and what they think I should be including, what they think I should be kind of shying away from. As well as I'm doing this presentation, looking for feedback from the QR code, any in discussions I'm going to be doing, um, with people on Twitter, uh, as well as getting through a very long, a very long, and a very rapidly growing reading list, which includes not just the books pictured, but also Twitter, people's threads on Twitter, uh, kind of talks, uh, GitHub links, courses, 
anything I can get my hands on, I'm looking through and I'm trying to add in as much as I said, we're curating content here. So reading it and then evaluating the scene work would be a benefit for the students. But I'm not just looking to, you know, shape the future myself. I am also looking for industry to get involved. And there's a couple of ways that I've got kind of outlined on this slide to kind of show you. These includes like doing careers events, ideally doing them the sooner the better so you get in front of the students from year one and kind of tell them the, the opportunities that are available to them. One way you can do that kind of without going to the events is by doing posters. Sands uh, seem to have a corner of the market when it comes to educational cybersecurity posters. It does not have to be this way. Many universities, including Aberty, but up and down the country, would be happy to see like branded posters about things about like maybe certifications or some white paper research that you've done as that company. Um, if you write it up as a poster or an infographic. University would happily put up this on the wall and you'd be able to get kind of into students kind of heads and they'll remember your name or maybe remember the research when it comes to doing an application or an interview. Another thing you can do is guest lectures as I kind of spoke about the one we got from Pentest Partners. Uh, appropriateness trumps availability. Not just saying that you can do a guest lecture, try and work with the academic to say what you could do in that regard. And if you really want, you could take it a step further by doing a guest lectorial and adding a workshop, um, which might be with the academic skill set, it might be something that you could kind of guerrilla teach in that kind of regard. If you want the students to know about a specific tool, maybe perhaps a tool your company creates, then you can teach them that way. Those are kind of the, the things you can do as an individual, but if you want as a, an organisation to be more involved, then industry liaison groups in which universities kind of run committees from companies to kind of get your ideas as stakeholders. Many universities have these, Aberté has one, so if you want to get an, uh, Aberté's one then by all means drop me a line. Also educational resources, if you've got con like resources you've released and maybe it's not well documented then go back and get an intern, get someone to look at the uh, documentation and promote it. And that kind of idea that the curation that I do as a lecturer, documentation is king. So educational resources that your company might have, go back, look at them, see if they can update them, promote them more. Um, and if you've got like kind of old content that you've not used in a while, maybe you gave a B-sides uh, kind of village or you did a um, workshop at an event, release it wider, think about the students that might use that as inspiration, might ask you questions, get in contact, um, and give back to the community that's there. Additionally, the educational licenses, um, if you've got uh, the tools and stuff that you need to do, think about educational licenses. As I've mentioned, Aberté does not have a lot of money, and I know a lot of the other universities are in the same situation, that they can't afford to buy tools that are a couple hundred pound per person or per computer. Um, the reason that we can afford software such as VMware is because their site-wide license is quite uh, lenient and therefore uh, and quite cheap. So therefore we're able to use it um, in that kind of regard and it gives them a corner of the market that way. So if you've got a tool that you want to make sure that people are using more or perhaps you want to get into universities or you think that it would be a benefit to the students, then please explore educational licenses. It means so much to small universities as well as independent hobbyists who might want to learn. So with that, that is the end of this talk, as you'll be glad to know. I've got a list of all the references as well as the movies here for the students who want to you know, go back and actually watch movies as their taste is very limited. They've got a limited palette as I commented on. You can also find um, a bigger QR code here to provide feedback. I'm going to keep this open till late as in I'll randomly check it every now and then again in case people have yet to this video. Uh, I've also got the GitHub uh, for myself here which includes a couple of my teaching content as well as some stuff that I've done on the side and my Twitter where you can get contact me probably best. 
Um, so with all that, that is the end. If you've got any questions, get in contact. And thank you for listening.